Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, I'm honored and I kept hearing over and over, you need to talk to Dan, you need to talk to Dan. And as, as we talk about this, it's Doberman Dan. And is that the Doberman barking? Uh, you know what? I Can love I the shit? intro. You know, I, 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 I have to keep going with it because this is what makes it real. And so today we have Dan Gallup, who is also known as Doberman Dan, as you heard, who's one of the legends of copywriting and direct response marketing. He's been running successful direct response and online businesses since 1995. And I remember watching your videos, Dan, like you know, you've been running businesses since you know, before the internet. And so you're going to talk about direct mail and, you know, the successes with that and how that can be applied today. And he keeps a very low profile and remains behind the scenes, except for being featured speaker at several seminars put on by the legendary late copywriter, Gary Halbert. Dan, thank you so much for joining me. It is my pleasure, Jeremy. I've been looking forward to it. Uh, apologize for the noise. I told you. No, that's <laughs> You know, it comes with the territory, you know, we don't do editing. So we just we just go with the flow and go with the conversation takes us. But I'm really excited to hear your big lessons learned, what worked, what didn't work in your journey. I always like to start off with a fun fact. And so people get to know you a little bit better. A fun fact is you wanted to be a full time musician. Tell I me about did. that. From <laughs> I haven't. I actually haven't had an opportunity to share this in a long time, so I appreciate it. Uh, I'm going to get rid of the dog. <laughs> First of all, I'm going to share something that I've not shared with anybody. Okay. This is like only the closest friends know this. I've not shared this on any interview. Okay, this is the Doberman. <laughs> He may look like a Shih Tzu. This is Cheeky Riki, named by my wife, who's from Colombia. So that's hence the exotic name. He may look like a Shih Tzu. He has the heart of a Doberman. When my Doberman died a couple years ago. I didn't even know that. I'm sorry yeah, to hear that. Just a few months shy of age 14, oh, which sorry. was darn near a record. Um, I think he passed his heart into this little guy because <laughs> he thinks he's a Doberman. But... I'm currently Doberman less right now, uh, but sorry to hear so, that. Yeah. So yeah, about the the musician thing. Yeah. I came home one night from pizza night with a family, and uh, the Partridge family was on. You're way too young to remember that. I, I do remember the Partridge family. <laughs> I saw Keith Partridge dressed in that cool stage outfit, his long hair playing the guitar and the women swoon, swooning over him. And I made the decision right then and there at age seven, that is what I want to do with the rest of my life. And I, uh, I dove into the guitar and just immersed myself in it with the intention that was going to be my, the only thing I would ever do for a living. And uh, I gave it, I was really involved with, with music while I was in school and high school. But when it came time to actually go for it, Living out, I, I pretty much gave it a half baked effort. I gave up way too soon because I, I listened to the Dream Stealers, which uh, actually turned out to be my family and my friends. That's usually who it is, right? Uh, sadly, uh, you wouldn't expect it. Dream Stealers sounds like these evil outside people or something, but yeah, usually family and friends. And I was young, didn't know any better, so I listened to them and I, and I allowed that dream to be. Yeah stolen away from me. That's how I wound up in this direct response stuff. So what kind of things were they telling you? Because obviously they have your best interest in heart. So they're not trying to steal your dreams but probably kind of push you in a direction they think you should be pushed. What are the things they were saying and and uh, you think it was they were uh, it was correct in them, you know, pushing you that way? Well, it was mostly my mother. She grew up dirt poor poverty Mississippi. I mean, you ain't seen poverty until you see Mississippi poverty. Uh, literally, really? yeah, literally no shoes. This was like in the 40s. No shoes. The only, you know, two alcoholic parents. Really? Holy cow. Uh, the only reason she ate was because her aunt and uncle owned this little corner store. And so that was her, that was the 
the filters through which her sure. she saw the world. And so to her, you know, being a musician was incredibly stupid. It was a way to starve or go broke or be homeless. Yeah. So, you know, she didn't do it maliciously, but she was really persistent about it. And of course, you know, success in anything is an immediate. So when I had a hard time supporting myself with that, you know, the onslaught of you've got to get a, a steady job or you've got to get some training, to get a steady job. Yeah. I didn't know any better. I just gave up. Knowing mm. what I know now, could I have made a living in music? Without a doubt. Would I have gotten rich and famous? Highly unlikely. <laughs> but that was never the goal anyway. Yeah. I mean, with her, she just didn't want to see you where she was. You know? Exactly. Yeah. So what did she end up doing then? Uh, you later? mean when I, when I gave up? or No, just later in life. What did she end up doing? Um for a career or she was you know she was the first one out of her family to graduate high school which was a big deal believe it or not yeah. and then when she had when my sister and I were really young she actually went back to college at the wow. University of Akron and got a degree wow. um, and but always concerned about that security just always yeah. so stuff like uh, um, she worked uh, like in human resources at the Smuckers Company, the Jelly yeah. Company, yeah, sure, in Orville, Ohio. And then she got a gig at uh, one of the uh, public schools, one of the county schools in Montgomery County in Ohio. So, mm -hmm. yeah, very security minded. Yeah. I ask because a lot of times when people come from that really tough background, they really, you know, excel and kind of push. They have that kind of deep burning to never go back to that place. And I don't know if that was instilled in you. I, I think I think it was. I mean, any kind of ambitious activities, or when I mentioned entrepreneurial things, it wasn't discouraged. It was never encouraged either. It was always with a caveat. She was so security-minded. The caveat always was, great, do that if that's with the exception of the music thing <laughs> it was like great do that if that's what you want to do but make sure you have a day gig that's secure mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so dan i want to get into your story growing up but i wanted to give the audience something what's something they could do right now to your best advice to start getting results whether it's within their marketing or copy you know here's what i did after after like nine years of every single entrepreneurial venture just turning out, out to be a big stinking money losing mess was I just found a successful model and duplicated it. And my model, this was pre-internet or you know before the internet was even a viable media, my model was how Dan Kennedy sold me his magnetic marketing kit. Mm -hmm. And I actually pretty much swiped that model exactly and adapted it to the bodybuilder consumer market. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So how did and, he sell it to you? Um, you know, I still can't remember how I initially came upon Dan Kenny. Probably like a lot of people, I think it may have been at one of the success events. And uh, so one way or another, I got uh, some sort of promotion in the mail, letter in the mail. And I bought that mag magnetic marketing kit for four hundred dollars or three ninety nine, probably. And I, the intention was whatever traditional business I was attempting to start <laughs> at that time, which was failing miserably. Uh, yeah, I was buying this information to help me with that. But as soon as I saw this whole process, I thought wow, that's way cooler than what I'm doing. I want to sell paper in a three ring binder with a few cassettes for 400 bucks. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's a good one. And um, so what did you see in the process that really hooked you and that he did well at that time that you wanted to replicate? The, the, the I'll tell you what, the, the biggest thing that appealed to me was not having to go face to face, belly to belly with somebody or get on the phone with somebody. Uh, my true nature, in spite of the fact that, you know, I'm a performer and, and enjoy performing on stage and stuff like that as a musician, my true nature is, is, is an introvert. Mm -hmm. I, you know, as most copywriters are, I would really prefer to hide at home in front of this computer screen than actually, you know, go out and 
you know, be be the ex. I can play the role of an extrovert. Yeah, but that's not my true nature. So yeah. when I saw, man, this this dude can sell this stuff with the, for, for these incredible markups with a letter. That's what appealed to me. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I want to talk about some influences early on, but I want to ask. So how did you end up applying it to the bodybuilding? You said you applied it to the bodybuilding. That was uh, still still is. Uh, that was a big passion. I'd have to say that was probably the number two passion, the number one being music, bodybuilding being the number two. And I thought, you know, I'm already buying stuff in this market. I understand what these guys want. Mm -hmm. I can give them exactly what they want that I'm not seeing anybody. I wasn't seeing anybody doing at that time. Mm -hmm. And so it was... <laughs> was actually me being lazy and go as for going for the lowest hanging fruit, you know? I I understood the market. I didn't need to learn the market or learn their language or jargon or anything. Cuz you were uh, I already knew. Yeah. So I just went for some I I needed Jeremy, I needed something to work. I just needed a base hit. That's all I needed. For, for 9 years. To get things going. Nothing worked that I tried. Uh so yeah. Yeah, so, and we'll get into some of the things you tried that didn't work, and obviously things that did. Um, what did you see the need was at the time that was that was missing? Well, and it's still pretty much the same today. The bodybuilding magazines they'll feature like the. I'm so out of the loop on the pro stuff anymore. Um, they'll feature the latest Mr. Universe or Mr. Olympia winner and his training and diet, and and it's just so not applicable to to guys like me, just genetically average, you know, the 90 pound weaklings growing you have up. To, those people have to have this genetic code that allows them to look like, I mean, I'm sure it's a lot of hard work effort, but there is obviously the genetic piece to it. Like LeBron James, like obviously he's, you know, he's got a genetic, he worked hard, but he's got some genetics that help him get to the next level. Oh, big time. I mean, the guys who reach those levels are, they're genetic freaks. They've got the genetics to to achieve that physique. Um, there's there's a lot of drug use at that level. It's their full time gig. They can devote their lives to it. So what they do is not at all applicable to to normal guys like me. So that's where I found the, you know, my 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 niche within the niche is marketing to guys like me, the guys who grew up the ninety pound weakling and selling them something that would work. For them, which you know, a lot of people online are doing it now, but back then, it, it, it was just nothing like that in the magazines. So, what does work for people like you or the ninety-pound weekly? Just in case I want to get bigger, <laughs> the most, <laughs> the most uh, unexciting, non-sexy stuff you could imagine, and it's it's not actually. I don't, not anymore at least, I don't find it fun to do or enjoyable. It's doing the, the big exercises like squats, deadlifts, uh, chins or pull-ups, bench presses, stuff like that. None of this fancy schmancy, you know, isolation stuff and, and really watching the volume, keeping the volume manageable because your, your nervous system and your body and everything, your, your organs and your hormones can't. You know, for guys like us who are genetically average, we just can't recover from those really long workouts. So very actually the this is a, a departure what we're supposed to be talking about, but the routine that I sold was the first routine that worked for me. Ten years working out, hardly any results. First routine that worked for me was one set of twenty rep squats, supersetted, which means no rest with uh, uh, dumbbell pullovers where you lay over a bench and, and pull a dumbbell over your head. That's it, man. That plus hmm. like eating like, you know, like eating everything that isn't nailed down and drinking a gallon of milk every day. Wouldn't, a gallon of milk? Wouldn't recommend that anymore. But wow. back then I was so desperate to not be skinny anymore. <laughs> That's what finally worked. Wow. So let's go back a little bit. And you talked about your mom, but what, where are you from? What was it like growing up? I grew up in Barberton, Ohio, which is a, a small city outside of Akron. Um, interestingly, the same town where Gary Halbert grew up. He probably grew up maybe three hours from me. I didn't, we didn't know each other, obviously, but 
Um, uh, that whole area, I don't know what it's like now, but back then it was uh, mm -hmm. the rubber companies were based out of Akron. Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, you know, Barberton was a blue collar town, uh, a, a working person's town and uh, nothing, you know, cool place to grow up. Nothing, nothing bad against uh, about Barberton, but that was the environment that I grew up in. Yeah. So what were the early days of your career? What did they look like? Early days of of uh, direct response or just early you days? Were of, a pre direct response. What were you doing before? <laughs> uh, stumbling around. Uh, my my whole life plan. I got I got out of high school and of course you know uh, uh, raised by a single mom. She was broke. She didn't have any money for, uh, for to send me to the university or anything. I just, you know, I didn't know that there were grants available and stuff like that. And yeah. she had gotten remarried. So I literally graduated from high school. She got remarried and <laughs> moved away, moved out of the house we were renting, moved away with her husband to Dayton, Ohio. And I was left sitting on the porch oh, wow. steps of the house with my suitcases like, hmm, what am I going to do now? So I think the first job I found was a night watchman job at this rubber company this tire company so did you was take over the house then like were you no she moved i was homeless really <laughs> where did you go uh i actually hit up one of my friends he was still in high school i i hit up his parents uh tom and elaine foil unfortunately the elaine's not with us anymore oh, but they they allowed me to hmm weird haven't talked about this in years no, I appreciate um, it. And if it's too, if it's too tough, you know. No, I'm just yeah. surprised. I'm getting emotional yeah. about this. Uh, well, it sounds she, like uh, I'd be scared. Like <laughs> I'd be scared shitless, honestly, if that was me. It was scary. I mean, you know, I, I, you're 18. You think, ah, legal. I'm legally, I'm an adult. But you know, when I look back now, I think, my God, what a child you know, I yeah. was. Even when I got on the police department at 21, thinking I'm an adult. You're still a kid at 21. Oh, for man. sure. So yeah, I just rented a room. No, I'm uh, I'm tearing up. Thanks. No, <laughs> <laughs> it was scary. I really yeah. appreciate the foils allowing me to to rent a room, and uh, I found that night watchman job. It was it was horrible, man. It was uh, it was uh, it was in a really bad section of town, and it was a 12 hour shift from 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. and what do you I see? Like, what kind of stuff do you see as like a night watchman? I mean, you said that you were really skinny. Like, did you have to go up against big perpetrators or what? The, you know, wow, I haven't thought about that in decades. But that was a great. I was scared. I was scared in general. Most of my young life, I was scared. But that was scary. You know, I was a skinny eighteen-year-old kid, and here's these, you know, these older, burly tire guys on strike, and here I show up in this. Night watchman uniform, you know, with a badge, no training whatsoever. Right. You know, walking past these guys. And one of my buddies who was older than me, this big biker dude named Tom Good, uh, he walks in with me. Like, he walks me past the guys because he had to walk in past the strike line. <laughs> and uh, he says, Hey, this is my little brother. Tom is like, close to 300 pounds, big, huge, huge guy with a beard. <laughs> you know, it's, hey, this is my little brother. I want you guys to look out for him. Wow. <laughs> and uh, one of the guys said, has he got a gun? And Tom said, no, but I do. And I'm only two minutes away. This guy's never gave me any problem. Wow. And, um, and I, I discover right then and there, you know, like, yeah, I was scared of them. But I just go to the gate and start talking to him at night and found out they were scared, too. Those mm. guys were out of work and scared. I, you know, it was... It was a great lesson in, uh, you know, not necessarily persuasion, but just, uh, you know, listening to people. I just yeah. listened to those guys. Other night watchmen had some problems with them, like them harassing, you know, the other guys. I never had a problem. I just go to the gate and, and just talk. Hey, how's it going? And then just shut up and listen. <laughs> yeah. Worked, worked for me. So then you were at your, your friends. And so what was next? Well, let me see. That led to, there's the wife coming home. Uh, where did that lead? You said you went to the, you became an officer at 21? 
Yeah, yeah. I actually I moved I moved down to Dayton because uh, my mother got divorced, and she was in Dayton, Ohio, which is like three a three and a half hour drive south of where yeah. I was. So I, I moved down there, got a job uh, at Shilato Rikes, a department store. Got a job as the loss prevention guys, the guys who walked around in plain clothes looking for shoplifters. <laughs> I had the night watchman experience. So did they do any training with you for that? No. I mean, like, the other experienced loss prevention people took me around and said, okay, here's what we look for. Yeah, what do they look for? <clears throat> they look for people coming in, like, at the last minute, right before the store is going to close. And, like, the good thieves, you never caught. The pros were very rarely caught because they, they were just so good. The ones who weren't good would come in, you know, at the last minute and they'd be looking all shifty doing this stuff. This was before, you know, the surveillance cameras. Right. But it was so easy to spot a thief. You know, they just they'd come in and, you know, you'd pick something up and then look around and then, you know, put it back. <laughs> so that was the only training that I got just from the guys who'd already been doing it. Yeah. So when did you you said you entered the police force at some point? Yeah, guys I was work guys I was working with who worked in security at the mall said, Hey, uh, the city of Dayton is giving the civil service test for police officer next week. We're going to take it. You wanna take it? Here's the extent of my life planning at that time, Jeremy, my career planning at the time. My response was, What day is it? He said, Ah, oh, Wednesday. Yeah, what time? Yeah, I don't have class I was going to community college part-time. I said, yeah, I don't have classes and I'm not working. So yeah, why not? <laughs> and I took the civil service test just because they were never expecting to get hired as a police officer because um, I thought at the time that I experimented uh, too much with substances when I was in high school. <laughs> and they wouldn't let you in. Yeah. yeah. So I thought I'd be disqualified. It turns out that is quite a common thing for people of my generation. And they didn't think twice about it. The only thing the Dayton Police Department wanted to know when they hooked me up to the polygraph was, did I lie about it? And I see. Uh, so, yeah. yeah. Long story short, I got on the police department. Uh, the Dayton Police Department was in the police academy when I was 21. So I want to hear life after police, but I have to hear one crazy police story. You must have one that sticks out. There's a, there's a funny one. And a serious one. Which one do you want Which, to hear? Whichever you think uh, is, is better. Let me tell a funny one. Okay. Um, so I worked the bad side of town. I don't know the politically correct way of saying that. I worked the side of town where there was the most violence. And um, across the river from us, which we were not allowed to go, was the district where the University of Dayton was. And those kids... You know, we thought we had it tough on our side of town with all the shootings and stabbings and violence we had. Those UD students, man, when they started drinking or when there was a game, it was an absolute riot in the UD ghetto. And we thought, oh, those second district guys got it so easy. They work all the nice neighborhoods and they work the university. Right. You would think that for sure. Those UD kids were insane. So those guys got off at 11 p.m., our district got off at 1130. So their night shift, their midnight shift was in roll call. And they, the dispatcher started getting loud music complaints from the UD ghetto. Loud music complaints are like a minor deal, but the dispatcher has to clear them out. He can't sit on them. So he's, I was a rookie. I think I'd maybe been on two months or less. I just was out on my own, not with a training officer on alone, like the first week. So he sends me to address these loud music complaints, thinking that I'm going to get off in a half hour. So I'll go across the river into a district that's not mine that I don't know. I'll drive by or maybe just knock on a door and say, hey, got some complaints. Could you turn it down? And then I could go back to my district and then go back to the district office and go home. By that time, the second district midnight guys will be there. That's what I'm expecting, too. So I drive yeah. into the I didn't know it was a UD ghetto. I drive looking for the address. It's the UD ghetto. And it, <clears throat> there's a party at this house with at least 150 kids in the front yard. And they've pulled, that was, they're notorious for that, pulling the furniture out of the house and setting it on fire in the street. On fire? Yeah, on fire. So, 
So they had already, they're all drunk. There's a couple kegs there too. They'd already pulled the couch out into the street. I knew the fire was going to start in a minute. There's a live band on the porch. That's what the loud music complaint was about. I'm alone. 150 drunk UD kids. There's no backup, by the way, because second district is still in roll call. I'm alone. I could call for help. It's going to be 15 minutes before somebody gets there. So, <laughs> but if I left, I knew that, you know, I'd be in trouble because I didn't handle this. So I thought, I'm going to have to think fast. And uh, I just stopped and I waited till the band finished their song. And then I walked up to the guy playing guitar and said, hey, could I sit in? And he looked really nervous at first. I'm like, I, just one song, man, I promise. And then I'll give you your gig back. And he's like, okay. And, you know, all musicians know Johnny B. Good. So I said, hey, you guys know Johnny B. Good in the key of A? And they're like, yeah, dude. And the guy playing the guitar, he says, do you want to sing? I'm like, no, I don't know the words. Can you sing it? He goes, yeah, I'll sing. So I start playing Johnny B. Good. When it comes to the guitar solo, I do all the things like Marty McFly and Back to yes, the Future. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I put it behind my head. I'm playing that guitar solo behind my head, you know, doing the Chuck Berry thing. This is in uniform on duty, by the way. I wish we and, had a video of that if there was only YouTube. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm sure it would be on YouTube. That what started out as a pretty out of control party with 150 people shortly soon after blossomed into at least another hundred kids that came out to watch this crazy cop playing the guitar behind his head. And uh, they were trying to raise me on the radio. I wasn't answering because I couldn't hear. So they sent somebody from across the river from my district to come check on me. Another rookie, a female officer was in the academy with me, you know, probably weighed 100. 17 pounds soaking wet she comes to check on me and i look over while i'm playing guitar and she's standing over by the yard looking terrified because <laughs> i'm inciting a riot and uh i finished the song there's kids running from all the other ud ghetto houses over to see this you know and it is just i've, I've incited a riot i give the guy back his guitar and I'm like, hey man thanks for letting me sit in with your band that was fun and i leave and Mary, Mary Lou Cash, who was my backup at the time, she's like, she couldn't even talk. She's Dan, you, you turned this into a riot. We can't leave. What are we going to do? I, 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 you know, calm down. And I, I walked back up there, guys, and I said, by the way, guys, I forgot to tell you, the reason I showed up here is because, like, people down the street are complaining about the noise. Could you keep it down? I'm like, yeah, dude, you want to play another song? Like, no, 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 no. I got to go. And we left. Um, and <laughs> news of that got back to the chief because I didn't know this. I was still new. The neighborhood, like three blocks down the way, was kind of a swanky neighborhood, and the chief lived there, and he heard the party going on. And so he got news of this, and they called me downtown to the chief. This was a, a police department of 500 sworn officers, you know? It's not like a little podunk big, town. Yeah. You know, guys like me never get to talk to the chief. And he called me down to his office, and I thought, oh, crap, I'm still on my probationary employment period. I'm going to get fired. <laughs> so I had to come in um, early to go meet with the chief, and he says, hey, I know about everything that happened last night. And I start, like, I could feel my face getting red. He goes, I just want to tell you, you took a highly volatile situation that could have turned violent and with arson and you transformed it into the best PR event we ever could have had for the Dayton Police Department. I just want to tell you that was a very creative solution to a darn near impossible problem. And I thought, oh, okay. I was just having fun. Uh, but yeah, that was... That's I mean, like that was, out of one of the movies where it's like that point where it's, I know what you did and it could go really bad or really good. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. So, so, Dan, I love that story. How did you get into copywriting? I still don't see. So now you're playing. You know, you're in the police department. You're you're rocking out with the uh, <laughs> on the porch. How did they, that turn into copywriting? Well, somebody somebody hit me up. Uh, of course, they they never disclose this, but they her husband was getting started in a business, and they wanted to have me over to dinner because he was looking for help. And he starts drawing circles on a piece of paper. 
it was the Amway business. Uh, Have you ever been pitched on? I've been pitched, yes. Okay. So, I mean, I knew nothing about business. I knew nothing about that. All I saw, honestly, I didn't understand it, to be honest with you. All I saw was he talked about this initial level you want to hit called direct distributor. I still remember the amount of income they showed you'd make at that, $2,138. And that was like more than I was making on the police department. And I thought, oh, man, it looks like I could do this like a few hours a week, make the same I'm making at the police department. So then I could spend all that extra time playing music. So I got into the Amway business. Um, and that was one of the ventures I failed miserably at in spite of keeping at it for years. Uh, that's how that's that's really what launched my entrepreneurial stuff. So what was next after after Amway or during Amway? What are the yeah, things did you during, try? Um, wow, I yeah, Amway lasted a long time. I did everything they told me to do and went to all the conferences and So meetings. why do you think it didn't work? Um looking back now, even though they say you didn't you you didn't need to know how to sell and it's not about selling you need to know how to sell. You need to know about persuasion. Yeah. It seems like you were good at that, though. I mean, from early on when you were the security guard, you'd, you know, whether you call it persuasion or influence or whatever, you'd, you know, bond with those people. And same thing with the, you know, the police department. I was, I was good at it when it didn't involve money. Um, when it involved money, I sucked at it for many, many years. And I think that must have been some weird self-image thing or, you know, maybe hearing the, you know, the conversation at the top of the steps about money all the time when my parents would argue about that. Mm. Or anytime my mom would mention somebody had money or a lot of money, it was never mentioned as a fact. It was not like, you know, uh, you know, I'm going over to R uh, Rob Cormany's house. Oh, you know, his family has a lot of money. It was always like a with negative, disdain, negative you know? thing. Yeah. So I think a lot of you know negative programming yeah. went into that. So how did you? That's a good. That's a good point because a lot of people have that kind of stuff that is ingrained in them. How did you eventually get out of that way of thinking? I don't think I have, to be You're honest. Still with working you. on it, yeah. I, I'm still working on it. I think I will work on that until the day I die. Yeah. Well, how have you worked on it though? Because obviously you've, you know, to keep it, you have to overcome it to not give it away. Yeah. Um. You know, I think some of the biggest breakthroughs for me. Uh, yeah, you know, there was a lot of negative early programming from from family, right. and there was a lot. You know, boy, the Amway people will hate me for saying this. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of cult like activity in the Amway business, and there was a lot of negative mental programming in that too. Really, it was actually pretty. It was pretty overt at times, like. Um, yeah, at least in our line of sponsorship, how most Amway distributors made a majority of their income was from the sale of tools, tapes and books and okay. functions, not the Amway products themselves. That story came out decades later. But so they were really incentivized to sell those tools. So they talked about, you know, your negative mental programming. You're never going to reach fill in the blanks. You're never going to reach direct distributor, or emerald, you know, pearl, diamond until you get your head right. But that got twisted even more to God will punish you by not giving you the things you want if if you're not a saint, if your thinking isn't perfect. Really? Uh, That's pretty extreme. It, it was, it, I'm telling you, it was a weird group, man. It was, it was almost uh, the a lot of uh, really devout Christians in that. And so it was a, a method for them to promote their personal beliefs. It wasn't yeah. just a, a business. And so there were some weird beliefs pushed in that. But one of, the, one of those things that persisted was that, you know, geez, I'm not perfect. You know, I have these terrible thoughts. I wanna, I wanna choke people. I'm told I'm supposed to love people, which, you know, is one of the most profound uh, things in that 
video interview with your grandfather. Thank you. Um, yeah. How he over came that and is able to make a statement that what what can you learn from the holocaust right, and he right. said we need to learn to love not hate yes, uh yes. i really i'm sorry i never could have met your grandfather mm, thank you very much wow i would like i'm still learning how to do that like my initial inclination is i want to choke someone when they piss me off, right. you know. You seem like such a sweet guy, though. I would never guess that. Um, yeah, I've worked through a lot of those rage issues, yeah. <laughs> Jeremy. Yeah. No, um, you know, my, my my initial reaction is to fight. You know, um, of course, with age comes wisdom. So now I understand your grandfather's message so much more. Yeah. But you know, back in back during all those failures, I think that was in my head, like geez, I'm not perfect. Like all these people I see from stage or all these successful people, people I see, they seem perfect. I ain't perfect. So I'm never going to experience see. that level of success. They're kind of put on a pedestal. Yeah. 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 So then what was next after Amway? Oh, wow. Lots of stuff. Um, uh, geez, a couple other uh, multi-levels a jewelry business not a brick and mortar just a a face to face belly to belly deal that seems uh, random why jewelry i i don't know somebody uh, somebody got me into it i think uh my dad when i was a kid had like a part time indian jewelry business so i thought you know maybe that would be something cool to do um what else home improvement business uh two different vending businesses. You'd yeah. think of all things vending would be brain dead simple. And I managed to botch those up too. Why? How, do, how, would, how did you botch them? Uh, not getting the right location. Just having every person I approach or every location I approach just shoot me down. No, we don't want vending machines in here. Um, it not, not negotiating good, a good deal on what percentage that the, the location got from the vending thing. Not really... Gr greatly underestimating how much time it took. You know, I still had a full time plus job when I did this. I I worked like weird hours, like 4 p.m. to 2 a.m. We'll go home, sleep for maybe six yeah. hours. You eight or nine a.m. I had to be at court. Sometimes that would last all day. Yeah. So this is why I love hearing these stories, Dan, because exactly what you just said. When looking from the outside, everyone seems perfect, right? Even some people are looking at you. Like Dan's perfect. You know, Dan opened a book. He probably started writing letters and then he just made money. Like it came out of the faucet. But the reality yeah. is, you know, you go through, and that's, that's why I love talking about this stuff with entrepreneurs is you go through all this crap. I mean, people only see kind of right now, you know, but they don't see the 10, 12, 15 years of trying everything and not working and pushing through certain things. When did you have a big turning point? Big turning point was that was that first mail order business. Yeah, tell me about uh, that. Uh, initially, it failed too. I just didn't know. I didn't know what I didn't know. I took out a classified ad. This was back when magazines still had classified ads, <laughs> pre-internet. And I was trying to sell a self-published book for $7. What was the book? Uh, how I, I think I should get this right word for word how a genetically average Joe can mm -hmm. gain 20 pounds of muscle in eight weeks that's a good good headline though where did you learn that uh, the genetically average thing yeah. you know I just I knew from that's who I was the genetically average Joe was just a, a little hook I I came up with to try to be unique and uh, that was, by the way, that was my squats and milk program I told you about. Were you studying copywriting at the time? Or did you just naturally come up with a catchy headline? The only thing I had to study, because I didn't know there was anything else, yeah. was Dan Kennedy's magnetic marketing system. Mm -hmm. So uh, I thought this was Muscle, I say Muscle Mag International was where I placed the classified and I think their media kit at the time said they had a circulation of a hundred thousand so I literally thought I'll be conservative 
And I think <laughs> I'll only get 10% of people. I know people. where you're going with this. Yeah. You know, yeah. <laughs> only 10% will buy this book. So, you know, uh, you know, out of 100,000, I'll sell 10,000 copies. At seven bucks a copy, that's 70,000, you know, deducted my cost, you know, figured out I'd make $50,000, which was just an absolute fortune to me at, at the time. And, um, you know, big disappointment. I, I sold like one copy and somebody helped me figure out uh, that that was not the way to go. Generate the lead, follow up the sales letter. So I took a small, whatever it was, fractional page, one sixth of a page, just add out again to try this again, lead gen to a voicemail, then send them the sales letter. It was the, it was it was the first sales letter I ever wrote, and it was the first business I ever started that worked. That little sales letter on the first mailing converted 10% of the leads to buyers. Wow. So it's amazing. It, it sounds like the first piece of copy I wrote was a success, but actually, you know, it that was there were probably at least 18 different versions of that letter I wrote. And there were nine previous years of failure after failure after failure of me getting my, you know, the crap knocked out of me as a salesperson trying to mm -hmm. sell this other stuff, learning it the hard way. So if it looked like an overnight success, it sure wasn't. Yeah. Did you continue on with that same process or did you change it? Like putting the lead magnet sign to a voicemail, which would, what would they leave? Just you ask them for their address? Yeah, name and address. Yeah, and then you send it to them. Mm -hmm. And that was, and I, I, then I started branching out and doing the same thing in other markets, um, selling info products like that. That was my go to formula to test the lead, small lead gen ad. And then I got online in 1996. Granted, it was pretty uh, wild, wild Rough west. Rough around the edges, then. yeah. But uh, when Google AdWords became somewhat viable, then I just duplicated that same process with AdWords because it was faster to test sure. online. Yeah. So then you had that, um, that was a big turning point. What was the next big milestone for you? Uh, a big milestone was preceded by probably the one of my, not one of my, my biggest failure to date, the most humiliating uh, time in my life and uh, ironically what followed after that was a f few months later was the biggest success of my life in a, a bodybuilding nutritional supplement business yeah. that I had started. So tell me about the big, if you feel comfortable telling about the big failure and then about the big success. Well, <laughs> you know, if somebody, I think somebody should like maybe study my life and do the exact opposite <laughs> of everything I've done. And that's the way to go. Um, so I had this supplement business that I started in 2004 out of desperation because I lost uh, my income and was broke. And so these pro hormones were hot at the time, these hormone precursors. And I knew they wouldn't last long. I just thought, I'll take advantage of this temporarily. And that worked really well. There was a big demand for those. And sure enough, um, the FDA came in and then regulated all of them. So that like killed my business overnight. Uh, concurrently, at the same time, I was going through marital discord and, uh, and separated from my wife. So I had no income. My business was back to zero and no money, no credit. I was in debt. <laughs> was in debt, all my credit cards were maxed out. Wow. And no place to live other than like a 10 year old beat up Ford Taurus. So mm -hmm. I actually had to live in that car while I put my life back together. Holy cow. With my 80 pound Doberman, by the way. <laughs> he was living in the car with you? Yeah. Wow. And, uh, this was the end of May. So May, June, July in Florida, in the car, living in the car with no air conditioning. The air conditioner didn't work. <laughs> Just throw that on top of everything else, right? Yeah. Holy so, cow. Uh, Jeez. I, 
I guess I do my best work when my back is against the wall because That's, um, putting it lightly. Yeah, I developed a uh, a new supplement product, or I asked the lab to develop it. I should say the lab I've been using, and uh, I would go to the library every day because there was computer there and free internet, right. and basically had to start a whole new business again. Yeah. How do Luckily, you? I have to back up. You know, I have yeah. to ask this because. You, you've you know obviously overcome that, but at the time that seems almost insurmountable. Like, how did you motivate yourself, like in that situation, to actually? You know, most people, I don't know if they would be able to climb so quickly. Oh, I'm going to go library and do this new supplement business. I mean, people are stuck in the mindset and position they're in. It it did seem insurmountable at the time. It was completely humiliating. Uh, what I really wanted to do is I just wanted to go get some liquor and drink myself unconscious. Uh, but I had this dog with me that I mm. loved, mm. you know, and many days I would go buy his dog food and I wouldn't eat because the choice was, well, do I eat or does the dog eat? And I, I always chose the dog. Yeah. Although there were a few nights that dog food was looking pretty good. Yeah, I would see. Uh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> So, you know, so really the dog was a big inspiration like during that time, like taking care of, of the dog. I'm afraid without the dog, I'm afraid I might have made the decision. Yeah, got a few spare bucks. I'm going to go drink myself silly. Yeah, uh, because, you know, it's just a way of uh, masking the pain temporarily. But, you know, I had to take care of this dog and I had the hope I didn't have a whole lot of success under my belt, but I had enough success in various ventures that I knew yeah, I could pull out of this. You could do it. Yeah. Yeah. You'd seen it. Okay. So, uh, you know, it was humiliating. There, uh, You know, it was the lowest point of my life. I mean, you know, everybody talks about considering suicide. That, that actually seemed like a logical option at the time. Wow. It was it was really dark. Um, but you know what? That it seemed like that dog saved my life on, you know, metaphorically in that instance, actually physically and a couple other instances. But, you know, again, that cr Donner, my crazy Doberman, you know, having to take care of him. <laughs> I, I guess I can relate. To, I don't have children, but I can really relate to how people oh, feel sure. about their children. Yeah. I'm sure it's not the same, but, it, you know, maybe. No, I'm similar. sure it feels the same for sure. for pe Yeah. And plus... Dogs love you unconditionally. Yeah. <laughs> your, yeah. Your children, oh, is pretty nice. not so much. <laughs> no, maybe sometimes. Um, so then you pull, You were going to the library and you said, ne what was next? Went to the library. So I got, uh, got a website up, got copywritten for this product. I'm not going to sleep tonight, Dan, because of this interview, because I'm just going to be <laughs> thinking about this. So... Uh, <laughs> uh, so let me see. I, uh, I I recycle. I mean, I was desperate. I didn't have time to split hairs over this. I had to get something up. So I recycled as much copy as I could from the pro hormone product because it worked. Yeah, and then I adapted other parts to this new product, which had you know no pro hormone ingredients. It was a creatine monohydrate and some yeah. other stuff. Creatine was hu is huge. You know that was huge. Yeah, back then it was still huge. Now it's like commonplace. You can buy it in Walmart. But, you know, back then in that niche, it was, you know, the most popular supplement. So I go to the, that's what I was working on the library, getting the copy written and then getting that website up. Luckily, I still had a little email list from that previous product. Um, so as soon as I got the website up, I threw some traffic at it. And, uh, the lab actually basically gave me net 30 day terms on the product. I begged them to sell me really small quantities, I think, yeah. like 144 bottles. And they gave me net 30 day terms. If I couldn't sell this stuff, there would be one more debt. You're I up couldn't the creek, pay. yeah. So they, they fronted me that, um, threw some traffic at it, had a very small list, but luckily enough to get some sales. Some sales started coming in and and uh, I still kept living in the car. How do you fulfill it? You just were shipping it yourself? Um, I had 
a company, a fulfillment company that I had a relationship previously with all those other little ventures. I'm just trying um, to picture you in the car with a dog and then f- like a hundred bottles of <laughs> creatine or whatever it is in the yeah. with you. It was luckily I had the lab. I didn't have to do that. Uh, I had the lab ship it to the, the fulfillment okay. center and I had had a relationship with them for at least, I guess, nine years prior to that with, uh, with that little, with all the info businesses I'd done. So they took care of that. And then when the money rolled in, I just kept, you know, uh, eating tuna, living out of the car, and then rolling that back into more and more ads, which uh, was Google AdWords at the time. Was What was working? Was there was just anything that was early on, or were there certain things that were working at the time? It was, you know what, a lot, a lot of that, I think, was attributed to timing and luck because AdWords was still a new media and I was getting clicks on there ridiculously cheap. Mm-hmm. Like it was so cheap, man, maybe cost per acquisition was $5 at the highest. So five bucks or less on a $40 initial sale, you know? So uh, it was just, it, it was the wild, wild west days of Google AdWords and they were letting you throw traffic at anything. Yeah. So then when did you get out of the car? Don't it keep was me actually, in that my seat here. It, it was about a month. I guess it was about a month later. Yeah. Um, I'd saved up enough money. I could rent this little, uh, basically, two-room apartment. And I was thrilled with that. <laughs> and it had air conditioning. And uh, still just lived real extremely frugally. Because I knew, I, I learned this lesson the hard way from several other ventures. Uh, when you got a winning horse, you got to keep riding. Yeah. It. So what did you so do? I just kept rolling more and more and more and more money into it. Um, and I mean, I was living in poverty. This, this was a terrible neighborhood. The apartment, I, th- my office that I'm in now, I think is bigger than that apartment I oh. lived in. And I had no furniture, I had an inflatable mattress and that crappy old Ford Taurus. That was it. And still literally, you know going every day down the road to the dollar store to buy tuna for my meals. So just kept rolling that money in because no matter how much I put into AdWords, gosh, I miss those days. I mean, I would get it all back multiplied. Wow. So that business grew so fast. Um, It was, it grew so fast. My head was spinning. In fact, I didn't even look up for about four months. I just didn't look up. I just put my head down and thought, I learned this the hard way before. I am riding this horse until it drops dead. Mm-hmm. And when I looked up four, four months later, it, the realization finally hit me like, wow, I am living in dirt poor poverty and I make more money in a day than I used to make, you know, several months working for the police department. And, um, it was, it was that to me, that was an incredibly rapid turnaround. That was, that's still, uh, one of my favorite success stories, (laughs) not so much for the success. Yeah. That was cool. And just the contrast. Yeah. The extreme contrasts. So what did you do when you pick your head up and you realize, Holy crap, I am making lots of money. What do you do? <laughs> Honestly? Yeah. I, I The first thing I did, I went out and bought at the time, to me, was had been on my dream list for a long time. I went out and paid cash for a, uh, a Cadillac. Whoa. Um, I forget the model. A, a Cadillac and... You know, back in Amway, they had us do those dream boards where sure. you put the pictures up. Yeah. So I literally had this stuff on my dream board for whatever whatever it was, to, to over 10 years, 15 years. I bought the Cadillac and I, and I bought a Rolex. And I drove the Cadillac home and I had my Rolex on. And I walked into this apartment, living in dirt poor, living in the hood, man, and dirt poor poverty thinking, that is probably the second stupidest thing I think I've ever done. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Oh my god. Yeah, I can't imagine. So, 
Then what you that was big and so what was another big successful campaign later? And what you did that made it effective? Hmm. Let's see. Unless, well, unless I don't want to, I don't want to cut that sh- story short. If there's anything else with the no. that creatine business, okay. No, um, actually, uh, that business, well, it still it still lives today. Oh, really? I sold it uh, a little less than three years ago. Um, so you had it and, for a while. Yeah. Uh, let me see. Yeah, it started in. I'm forgetting. Started in 03 or 04. Um, yeah, and. Actually, until fairly recently, those guys, they're still selling pretty much the same product that I started with. And until recently, or maybe a year or so ago, it was almost 90% the exact same copy that I wrote. Really? Being homeless, living in my car in the, in the library in Gainesville, Ohio. It lasted all that time. Wow. So what was in that copy that worked? Um... Geez, I'd love to tell you that it was, uh, you know, brilliant copywriting and wordsmithing. It was not. It was just, I was, and still am to a lesser degree these days, though. But I was that market. I, I, I couldn't have known that market better. I knew their innermost thoughts, their biggest secrets. So what, secrets were, what and, were you saying in the copy? Because, you know, obviously now if you get into a market that you aren't that, you just people do a ton of research until you kind of try and get inside the head, but you were inside your own head. What were those big secrets or big things that you were hitting on? There were the, the, the stated things that everybody in that market wanted the, you know, bigger muscles, you know, six pack abs, yeah. Uh, you know, big biceps. Like anyone and, who has a huge YouTube fitness channel should listen to this right now. I mean, this is <laughs> golden for them. Go on. There were within those within that copy talking about there were there were implied things uh, like, you know, imagine uh, how the girl who you know laughed at you in high school because yeah. you were a 90 pound weakling yeah. or the girl who turned you down to go to the prom imagine what she's going to say when you know she sees you at summertime in your tank top and you know you're you're sporting your uh, you know 18 inch ripped biceps that was implied never directly stated implied yeah. um yeah. you know the, the revenge aspect, the admiration aspect, the the uh, women want you and men want to be you aspect, right. never overtly stated, but always always there in the, whatever you want to call it, in the undertones of the copy, because mm-hmm. that's what people really yeah. wanted. They didn't want, you know, uh, <laughs> They, they didn't, here's, here's some jargon from that market. They didn't want, you know, s- s- wide sweeping lats, you know, that, that sweep up from a tiny 28 inch waist, you know, to a 50 inch chest, even though that's what they stated. What they really wanted was, and this dude beat me up when I was a skinny punk teenager right. and I want to show him up. Or, yeah. I, you know, I, I couldn't get any girls when I was a skinny, you know, pimply faced kid, but now I want to get some girls. For sure. It's always it comes down to girls in the end. <laughs> Pretty much so. Um, we probably could have summed up this whole conversation. Uh, with so with the with the sale, so you sold the company. Do you sit on the beach? Do you do some? What, what do you do after <laughs> after the sale? Um, the truth of the matter is, I should be sitting on a beach. There are two reasons for that. Number one, I would very quickly get bored doing that. But number two, I've had some some successes in the past that could have been really, really big, but uh, probably to not probably, but due to self limiting beliefs, once they got to a certain level, mm-hmm. then I either consciously or unconsciously did things to sabotage them mm-hmm. to make sure they stayed at that level, or I destroyed them, and uh, sadly. So uh, I also, unfortunately, I hear this from a lot of entrepreneurs. This was a problem took a long time to overcome. 
when the money started coming in, I always just assumed it's always going to be this good yeah. or better. So the money came in and it didn't matter how much it was. It came in and immediately went out. Right. And a lot of times in stuff that didn't work out, like the, the $40,000 ad in penthouse I took out what without ever that? doing a test, uh, it brought in 4000 <laughs> What was it for? Uh, it was for a supplement product. And that would be painful enough in itself. But what sucked even more was I talked the ad rep into giving me 30 day net terms because I didn't have the 40,000 to begin with. <laughs> so, uh, so what was one of those that you said that was reaching a, a really good level and you just kind of kept it there, you think, because of the self-limiting beliefs? One of it seems like all my stories are in the bodybuilding market, um, probably because I spent so much time there. One of the products was a supplement product. There was a book by Dr. Ronald Klatz at the time called Grow Young with HGH that was really super hot. So this was a product that used amino acids that you know had some research that showed that certain combination of these amino acids help your pituitary um, release more human growth hormones. So yeah. that was the hook for this product. It was really successful in all the bodybuilding mags. So I repositioned it to a general health market anti-aging thing and tested some half-page newspaper ads. Now, in the, see, I didn't know any better. I was a rookie. In the bodybuilding magazines, everywhere I ran it in, I, I ran in all the magazines I could, it would bring back, depending on the magazine, four to six times ad costs. I thought that was normal. Um, I thought that was not only normal, but desirable. Um, so when I took out the newspaper space ads, uh, they, they pretty much broke even. Maybe a few of them made a little more than they broke even. And in uh, Nancy Jones, the media buyer I used at the time, she's like, oh boy. Um, well, here's, here's the newspapers we can roll this out to. I'm like, this woman is insane. Roll these out. I've only broken even. I'm getting, you know, six times ad costs from the bodybuilding magazines. I'm going to drop this. What I didn't realize at the time, I had a, a not, at least a nine figure uh, tiger by the tail. And the fact that I didn't have the money, I could have raised the money. As, as soon as any experienced direct response marketer saw those numbers, I could have raised seven figures practically overnight to roll that thing out. None of this stuff I knew at the time, by the way, Jeremy. And then the point being is I had found a system. I'd found copy and a system in a media that I could get customers for free. But I didn't understand that. Yeah. I thought break even was failure because I didn't make money. Um, there's just one example <laughs> of you know so you ended up not rolling it out to any of the newspapers nope by the time i finally realized what i had that fad had passed i i could have ridden that horse to that could have been retirement but you know didn't know what i didn't know and some self sabotaging uh programming going on there too and so you know i want to know also what are some of your favorite headlines yours from some things you've written or and or others that you've you've read um that's funny uh when you mentioned favorite headlines i would you mentioned mine i would never even consider mine when you mentioned that it's just nah my favorite headlines i think of other people i think most writers are hyper critical of their own work um i know i am so I guess it may be a better question is which of the headlines performed the best? Uh, I wish I could remember the, the one in the bodybuilding magazine. Uh, wow. It was something about the jealously guarded secret of the top pro bodybuilders. That was not it word for word, but that was the hook. And that jealously guarded secret being that they were all taking human growth hormone. Mm hmm. Um, trying to th uh 
I can't remember the headline for the for the creatine product. You know, the, the pro hormone product I told you about, <laughs> that headline was probably so crappy that I'd be embarrassed to share it. That that product was so hot, I literally have could my headline could have been um, whatever the name of that product was at the time, uh, you know, 19 nor androstein dione question mark we got it <laughs> that's that's all you needed to say back then that's funny um you what? know i'm trying to you know probably one of my one of one of my got a lot of favorite headlines one of my most of them will probably be gary halbert headlines a ted nicholas one which i totally swiped for my newsletter is the only way left for the little guy to get rich love that headline um, let me see, Gary Halbert, uh, uh, wow, I'm, I'm forgetting them. Actually, my favorite Gary Halbert headlines, look at any Gary Halbert ad pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> and you, you knew Gary, tell me about how that came to be. I said, I was a subscriber to Gary's newsletter and you know, he's from Barberton, Ohio, so I picked up on a lot of the stuff in his newsletter that he grew up with the same mental programming that I did, actually worse. And I just really related to him. And, uh, you know, he, a lot of times he, t he let his faults hang out in the newsletter, even though the voice that you read in the newsletter is not the real Gary Howard, it's a created persona. It's uh, an exaggerated, better version of Gary Halbert. He still uh, shared a lot of his insecurities and faults. And that was pretty uh, freeing for me to, to realize, oh, guess what? I don't have to be perfect to experience successes because look at Halbert. So I don't know, he just clicked with me. Um, and that was, that was his style of writing. Almost a lot of people, there's no gray area with Halbert. They either love him or hate him. And those that love him seem to feel like they have this bond with him. And that's how I felt. So I just started doing things to get on his radar, writing him letters, sending him faxes. The thing that finally got my first phone call was I just totally swiped his technique for getting a PWM's attention, PWM player with money. Um, I wrote a fake article about him and me working together and I had it formatted to look like the, the front page of the Barberton Herald, the newspaper. And uh, put in a real fancy frame, FedExed it to him, and uh, put references to Barberton I knew only he would get. And talked about us working on mail order projects. And we made so much money that we bought the entire city of Barberton and turned it into the world's largest parking lot. So <laughs> <laughs> my apologies to anybody who lives in Barberton. Um, so that got me a phone call and then it was just a process of just continuing to do things to get on his radar to get his attention yeah and uh probably one of the stupidest but one of the most fun was he he wrote an issue about costa rica and uh so i sent him a fax says i got some questions about costa rica sounds really cool i've never been there but i'd like to visit he called me with his girlfriend who was from Costa Rica and they answered my questions. I'm like, all right, awesome. The next message he got from me was an email. And I said, Hey Gary, remember a conversation about Costa Rica? I sold everything I have. And I live here now. And he was floored. He just couldn't believe that his newsletter could have that much of an impact on somebody. So he said, Hey, next time I come down, let's have dinner. We did. And then, he called me next time he was in town. He said, hey, could I crash at your place? I said, sure, Gary. And he's, he's going to crash the weekend. And he wound up staying there like four months. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, and, you know, we worked together during that time. Then he got a ton of client work from uh, Ed Dale, an internet marketer. And he, even though I didn't intend to move back to the U.S., Gary was a master persuasionist. And he persuaded me to move back to Miami and live in his apartment building. He had two apartments in the building, his and what he called his little client apartment. So I moved and lived there for about a year. So what were some of the biggest lessons you learned from Gary? Gary 
was brilliant it, for a lot of reasons, but Gary never taught me anything with the exception of one thing. Like he, one day he sat me down and he says, I want you to read this email. It was a response to a client and it was incredibly offensive and abrasive. Um, and, and the lesson was, you know, this is how you treat clients, which I, I don't totally agree with that, but I understood the You mean point his today. email to the client? You're yeah. Yeah. So other than that, he never taught me anything. Uh, what he did was he just let me observe right. and learn my own lessons. And he never taught me copywriting. Like he wouldn't, okay, we're going to write this or do it this way. Now, all he did was throw a, a yellow legal pad, which I, I would prefer to type things, but he ins I still have them all over the desk right now. I have, I have the same thing right here. Do yeah. you feel? Do you feel like more connected when yeah. you write like by I have hand? Notes like yeah, I'm writing right here. Yeah. So he he insisted I write on a. a that's all he do. He like it's time to work. He'd throw that yellow legal pad down in front of me and make me write. Yeah. And, you know, whatever, here was his correction, here was his teaching on copywriting, you know, he'd, he'd read my stuff and it was, it was either this, here was his response. And he'd set it down. That meant I got approval. If it was an, if it was an exceptionally good, like I sweated I cut a vein open and bled to create this. His response would be, you're a good writer. That's it. A majority of the time, the response was, <laughs> that was it. And I'm like, okay, it's time to start all over again. <laughs> so what did you observe then? What were the lessons that you observed from him? If he didn't, obviously, um, explicitly teach anything obviously there's something implicit there that gets absorbed um he wasn't known for being speedy or prompt or getting stuff done on deadline <laughs> and i discovered why uh he would say all right we gotta write this piece you know about whatever so you need to be at my door at 8 a.m and be prepared you know we're probably gonna work for at least 12 hours maybe 16 <laughs> And I'd show up at 8 a.m. and he'd still be asleep. I'd bang on the door, you know, wake him up. And the whole day consisted of, uh, you know what, it's early. Let's go get some coffee. We go get coffee. We goof off down there in the coffee shop. And then he's like, uh, I need some parts for my boat. We go get parts for his boat. We go to the boat. It's like Mr. Miyagi or something. It, you know, that's it what it really seems was. Like. He'd, uh, he'd uh, you know, what? let's go out on the boat. Let's go on the boat. You know what? We need some music to write copy to. I know just what we need. Let's, you know, go 15 miles. There's a perfectly good CD store down the road, but we need to go to this one 15 miles away, which takes like, you know, three hours one way in Miami, 15, <laughs> 15 miles. Uh, we need to go there. A whole day was like, oh, it's lunchtime now. Let's go eat lunch. Oh, it's dinner time now. Let's go eat dinner. This went on for weeks. And, I, and I'm nervous because I'd saw the check come in and the deadline come and go yeah and uh you know finally after weeks of this we're out on the boat and we're talking about nothing it was like an episode of F seinfeld every day we're talking about nothing not talking about marketing we're not talking about the copy and when i did try to talk about the copy immediately got me off topic and so finally one day we're out on the boat we 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 went out we've been out you know like 45 minutes and you could almost see the light bulb go on. He's like, turn the boat around. That's the only thing he said. And I knew to, I knew to stay quiet. I just turned the boat around, went back and docked. He didn't say a word. We walked up to the apartment, still didn't say a word. He sat down at the dining room table where he worked and just started writing. And in about an hour, finished that piece of copy. All that time, those weeks and weeks that I thought was goofing off wasn't. It was... He'd packed his brain with all the stuff he needed to do for to write the copy and was letting letting the ideas happen, unlike I would always do, would force it, you know. I'd always try to force it, even if it sucked. But that was a huge lesson from Gary. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. So what are some of the most common mistakes you see people making with copywriting? 
with because I've seen I've watched some videos. You you've had mastermind students, so I'm sure there's a lot of people coming to you. And obviously, Matt, who I just interviewed, said he owes you a box of cigars because of what you told him. Sure. Um, what are some big mistakes people are making or that you see? I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you a mistake that uh, probably most people are not ex- expecting me to say, and it's it was inspired by Matt's interview with you, and that is, you're good enough right now. You don't need you don't need anybody's anointing. You don't need anybody's approval. You don't need to be anybody's copy cub. All that stuff is great. Mentoring is awesome. Don't take, don't get me wrong. And a true pro never stops learning. I'm not saying that. Yeah, yeah. What I'm saying is, you are good enough now, and good enough is good enough. I've I've had some really great successes with really half-assed copy. <laughs> um, just get started and just get. Uh, just get started and do it. You know, the more hours you put in doing it. And the cool thing about copywriting is while you're learning it, while you're putting in the hours, you, you can be making money with it. You don't have to be a master copywriter, whatever that is. I don't really understand what that yeah. is because I certainly am not a master. I mean, the process of mastering, yeah. but I certainly am not a master. So you're, good enough is good enough. Um, once you've you know overcome that hurdle then it's about everybody gets this backwards it's pretty much 90 percent research 10 percent writing uh the research is critical that's why my sucky copy all those years in the bodybuilding market did so well and even guys i hired and paid five figures to couldn't beat me i'm not you know uh beating my own drum saying i'm a great copywriter i'm I'm telling you the opposite. I wasn't that great, but I understood that market so well. I understood their their most secret, unspoken desires. Yeah. That's why it worked. So research, 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 proof elements. You know, don't be making claims you can't back up. Yeah, I mean, you've written for other niches besides the supplement. Can you tell me one of those in how you discover those unspoken secret desires. You know, for people who may be writing or in a, initially, maybe they don't full, they're not in that, they're not a bodybuilder or whatever, a woman don't, or women's makeup or whatever they're writing for. What was another one that you wrote for that was, you figured that out? Um, one of my uh, info businesses was, well, I got into business to business stuff. And since there was nobody, there was, there was guys like Joe Polish selling how to get customers, you know, or how to, with direct marketing kits. And, and there were guys in chiropractic doing that. So I found a niche where there wasn't anybody at the time, which was martial arts. I took like two karate classes, you know, when I was in fifth grade. I knew nothing about it, you know? <laughs> right. So, but yet I'm going to be the marketing expert to martial arts studio owners. So, um, you know, writing for them, I guess I had moderate success in the beginning because all all I talked about was getting more students, making more money, which was, that's pretty strong appeal. Um, But when I, you know, when I went back and looked at my bodybuilding stuff, I, you know, I guess I did it unconsciously at first. And then I realized, you know, I'm talking about all that benefit stuff in the bodybuilding market, but there's an underlying theme of the unspoken desires too. So I right. wonder what would happen if I did this in the B2B stuff, you right. know, instead of saying, uh, you know, you're going to get more students, more, make, more, make more money. It was uh, imagine dot, dot, dot. Uh, I love, by the way, there's a, there's a quickie little tip. Yeah. If you don't know how to start, that's a great way to start a sales letter after the headline. Imagine dot, 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 and then start painting the picture of your prospect's ideal situation. Yeah. So I did that with the martial arts studio owners. Imagine, you know, you, you drive into your studio, um, you know, your special reserve for the president spot up front is available. For you. The place is packed with students. You walk past your secretary. She says she's got 10 people, 10 new student uh, 
the consultation is lined up for today, same as yesterday, same as the previous 30 days. And I started hitting on the security aspect of that and how, how having that steady income of money can affect your security and peace of mind, yeah. that kind of stuff. Yeah. Love that. Yeah. Three things. Unspoken desires, imagine, and paint that picture for people. And I have a left field question, sort of. I mean, sure. I was watching a video and you were talking about nutritional. And I have to ask this because I have this written down to make sure I get it. Is you say in one of the videos about getting uh, a magazine ad for 10% of what <laughs> the actual cost is? Yeah. I would love to tell you I thought of this idea. I s totally swiped it from somebody. But it works killer. I've not used it a lot, but every single time I've used it, it's worked. Um, uh, when I was doing the martial arts stuff, speaking of that, there was a magazine called NAPMA, National Association of Professional Martial Artists, and I needed a full page ad. And their their rate card was four hundred or I'm sorry, four thousand dollars. I wasn't a great negotiator, I, so I would always resort to begging. You know, I'd poor mouth them, and I'm, I'm poor, I'm broke. You know, this is going on my credit card. I, you know, I, I begged that dude for literally two months. I would call at least once a week, and that ad rep wouldn't budge. He says, "We don't negotiate our ad rates. Those are the ad rates of the state." So, so I, I probably heard this from Halbert or Nancy Jones, the lady used to work with for media buying. So this was in the old days. Uh, Jeremy, you don't even remember this. Then uh, magazine ads and newspaper ads were on this what they call Velox paper. This this transparent stuff. Okay. It was camera ready, whatever they called it. So I had it prepared by a graphic designer, camera ready, and I mailed it to the ad rep at Natma with a letter and a check for five hundred dollars. This is a four thousand dollar ad, and I wrote out a check for five hundred dollars in a letter and and said. Here's my camera ready full page ad ready to be run at any time. If you should ever happen to have an open space, feel free to cash my check and run it at your discretion. And um, they ran it immediately. They ran on the next issue. Wow. Like I said, I've only done it a handful of times, but it's yeah. always worked. That's fantastic. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. <laughs> I remember I'm like, I need to ask him this. Um, <laughs> so you talked a lot about some of the low point, I mean, a lot of low points and some of the successes. What's some things you tell someone to do right now if they just want to start, you know, start marketing, start doing better for their product or service? Um, resistance comes from all kinds of different things and, and breaking the resistance is very simple in theory, but very difficult to do. So as, as cliche and hackneyed as this sounds, mm. you actually just have to get started yeah. in something. Um, you know, if, if, if you're starting with nothing, then just sit down with a, with a, you know, if you prefer to do it on Word or whatever, or a notepad, and just start writing. Yeah. Um, if you're desperate, like I've been numerous times, and you need to make money fast, um, you know, back in the old days, I'd recommend that you follow the model that I did. Nowadays, it's, things are a lot more saturated than they were. So, uh, the model that I would recommend, if somebody is needs to make money fast, is find some kind of high value skill you can offer. If you don't know one, then get cracking and learn one as quickly mm -hmm. as possible, and do that. It, 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 granted, it may not be your ultimate dream gig or dream business but yeah. um it, it get it can get a lot of money coming in quickly like in my case you know it would be copywriting or or consulting or coaching or something like that mm -hmm. if you've got some sort of high value skill like if you could remember you asked me that three people i wanted would like to meet sure there was one guy on that list you probably never heard of alan holdsworth mm-hmm my the favorite, jazz, the jazz guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Favorite guitarist in the world. If there were some dude who was credible and could show me the results of this and said, "Hey, Dan, in ninety days, six months, a year—I don't care. 
ideally less than a year. <laughs> I can teach you to solo like Alan Holdsworth. I couldn't write that person a check fast enough. Really? And they could pretty much they could pretty much tell me. I, I'd leave the check blank and tell them you fill it in. You should and, then. Uh, wow, that's that's remarkable. And and you know, I think everybody has some sort of skill yeah. that is valuable to somebody else. You know, if you've lost a lot of weight, there are people who will pay you for coaching for that or for advice. And, and the reason why I'm suggesting offering a service initially if you need cash fast is because you can get higher fees for that, you know, and no usually it costs. Yeah. yeah. As opposed to an info product business. Later on, when you've got the money you need and you've got that immediate need satisfied, then great. Then start an info product business. Yeah. and it'll all feed itself. The info yeah. business will feed your coaching business, vice versa. Yeah. So that means you should be writing or have uh, something in the guitar niche for yourself because, <laughs> and I interviewed the, the founder of the, the Chord Buddy. I don't know if you've heard of that. Oh, yeah. So you should, you should be writing, he should be paying you big bucks to write copy for him. I mean, that's, uh, you probably have some killer information to, uh, to sell more of those Chord Buddies. <laughs> I definitely can... I can speak the lingo of that crowd too. And plus we guitar players are, uh, listen, man, if, if we're to be honest, the real reason we picked up the guitar was to impress girls. It comes back to the girls. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, Dan, I usually ask about, since it's inspired insider, ask about the low point and the proud moment. And you talked a lot about low points and, you know, there's one that I was researching that I thought you were going to talk about, but you didn't which was when you had the emergency surgery. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, not that like you've been beaten down enough, but <laughs> what happened with that? I'm pretty grateful to be speaking at all. Um, yeah, anyway, I went to the doc. I, you know, my voice was getting scratchy and I could see something in my throat. Turns out it was a cancerous tumor. <clears throat> Uh, thyroid, which, you know, as the nurse said, which was not really reassuring at the time. She's like, well, if you got to have cancer, thyroid's the best one to get. Right. Um, so you know, I guess statistically, thyroid cancer doesn't normally doesn't spread, you. you know. So um, I'm thinking, oh, OK, cool. Well, you know, we'll get that taken out and hopefully be done with this. But um, what the surgeon have found out as the tumor wrapped itself around my vocal nerve, oh my God. the nerve that controls your vocal cords. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's why my voice was scratchy. And when I talked for any length of time, I'd start to lose my voice real fast. So, um, they just said, ah, you know, I'm good, but I don't know if I'm that good. So your vocal n nerve may need to come out. Wow. So the, the best case scenario would have been you know, I'd be left like a Clint Eastwood kind of voice. <laughs> you'd be able to talk, but really not that well. Yeah, you'd be like, you'd have a whisper kind of thing going on, which maybe would scare the people. You know, like, well, let me ask you something. Do you feel lucky, punk? That's pretty good. Um, you know, it's just cool when you're imitating Clint Eastwood. Not so cool when you're trying to, I'd like a sweet tea, please. No worries. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, went into the surgery thinking I'm either going to come out of this not speaking or, you know, maybe I'll be lucky. So I obviously picked the right surgeon. I can't really sing anymore. I've totally lost what range I had. Um, but I'm, I'm glad to be still speaking. You know, I got to tell you, I, I don't really view that as a low point. I really don't. Uh, that was also emotionally freeing for me. How uh, so? You know, when you realize that none of us are going to get off this earth alive, <laughs> it makes it easier to enjoy the ride mm -hmm. a lot more. And, you know, not that I was ever, uh, not that it was ever a, an issue of it being, you know, a, 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 a fatal thing or cancer that could spread and turn into terminal thing statistically thyroid cancer doesn't do that but cancer automatically has that stigma to it that it's a death sentence For sure. so you know i guess i you know started thinking about my mortality and stuff and 
all that stuff was outside my control. The, am I going to be able to speak? Or are they going to have to cut my vocal nerve out? Totally outside my control. I was worried, yeah, but you know, I worked really hard to not let it control me. The only thing I could do, just like when I was homeless, the only thing I could do was just focus on what I could control and, and do that. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, that was as crazy as it sounds. That was actually a good experience. A freeing moment. Yeah. So what's been, Dan, one of the proudest moments? Hmm. You know, I can't point to a one moment as the proudest moment. I guess if I'm proud of anything, I would, I, I'd have to say I'm proud of the fact that I have persisted in the face of adversity mm -hmm. um, time after time and continue persisting because the adversities still come. Uh, you know, anybody who tells you they've arrived is lying. Or if, 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 if you've read anything on my blog post or my newsletter and I, maybe I've not disclosed all the bad stuff, so all you see is the good stuff, so you think, like, I've got it made or I've arrived. Well, you couldn't be more mistaken. The adversities have not stopped. Uh, I guess what I'm happiest about is that I've continued to persist. Yeah. Um, it's really easy to let adversities yeah. sideline you or stop you at all. And some people don't, you know, they don't just give up. They, they give, you know, they, they just let it sideline. They stop trying anymore. So I wouldn't, I guess I wouldn't say I'm proud of that. I'm, I guess I'm happy I'm pig headed stubborn because really any logical, rational or sane person would have quit 20 years ago and just accepted the police department gig. I mean, that was a steady gig with a, a guaranteed retirement. Yeah. So, yeah. uh, I, I guess the thing I'm happiest about is for some reason I seem to have this bullheaded persistence that won't allow me to quit even mm. when I want to. Yeah. Yeah. Dan, this has been an absolute pleasure. I so much appreciate your openness and just your amazing stories. And, and before we end, I just want you to tell people where can they find you and what are you working on lately? They can find me at DobermanDan.com. Doberman like the dog, D-O-B-E-R-M-A-N-D-A-N.com. And uh, what am I working on now? Well, maybe by the time this interview airs, my new website will be up. Okay. So a uh, new positioning there, um, positioning myself to work with uh, n not so much startups or um, people specifically interested in online marketing, but established businesses that want to, that are successful already, but want to expand and will, and are looking at all media to yeah. expand in. So yeah. if I'm working on that, I'll have a new uh, report up there, um, uh, tentatively titled uh, How to Go from Six Figures to Seven Figures and Beyond. And um, I've been doing some work with a, with a, an 800 pound gorilla in direct response marketing and they are just uh, salt of the earth people who run the show there. Um, they focused on financial publishing and but they've discovered that their audience really is interested in health so they've asked me to head up a new uh, supplement division for them. So that's a, that's a big... That's fantastic. Yeah. yeah so I'm what do you excited. have to do for that? Everything. <laughs> I mean, do they have the product and you just have to do all the media and, and uh, copy? Or it's the do you have coolest, to do both? It's really cool. Uh, this company is like a $600 million a year company. Oh. So they have all the infrastructure established, like legal, accounting, customer service, all the high-tech stuff online, all that stuff um, – and what I'm doing is I'm developing, I'm doing everything. I'm basically starting a brand new supplement business um, as if it were mine. So doing all the research on and product development, all the marketing, all the copy development, writing copy, yeah. copy chiefing, some copywriters. Um, again, these people are uh, just incredible. I can't say enough good things about them. And they've been nice enough just to, you know, basically hand this deal off to me and say, 
here's your dream gig, you know. Um, That's awesome. Here's your, you know, start a supplement business and you've got a $600 million a year company behind you. <laughs> so I'm pretty excited. How did you know them? Just personal connection or? Yeah, uh, a friend of mine, uh, a copywriter, uh, is is doing some work for them and he introduced me uh, to the people there and uh, I wrote a piece for them and then you know they've just been really open about their business and sharing things with me and so we all put our heads together and, and figure out what, what can we do that will have a really big impact on the bottom line and this new health division slash supplement hmm. company was it yeah so I mean, you can't say but where do you start with something like that because uh, you know, supplement, you could do anything. I mean, you could do like bodybuilding proteins or omega fatty acids or where do you even begin? I here's how here's how I put a roof over my head and fed myself for you know over a decade in the bodybuilding market. What I did there was uh, I just followed the leader, the big whoever the big eight hundred pound gorilla was in that niche did all the research and figured out what was hot. That's mm -hmm. a very fat oriented market. And I would just follow them and do a similar product. Um, in this case, I don't really have that option. So the, the, the strategy I'm taking is, this is a great product development strategy for any market. The strategy I'm taking is I want to find what my friend John Mendoza calls the bleeding neck. When you've got a bleeding neck, you know, you may have just been shot in the kneecap, <laughs> you know, and you got blood stains on your shirt and your dog is off his leash. But all that other stuff can wait because we need to address this arterial blood shooting out of your neck. Right. Yeah. So I, I'm doing research to find the closest thing to a bleeding neck I can find in that market, the, the biggest pain points I can find in, in addressing those. So that's where the product development is going to start. I'm starting with the problem and then developing the, the product to, to, to alleviate the pain. For sure. Dan, thank you so much. What website should we leave people with to check out and also that I should put at the bottom of your, when I have the picture interview, you know, under your, under your face the whole time, what, what should I put? <laughs> Oh, cool. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, uh, DobermanDan.com is okay. a good one. Great. Dan, it's been an absolute pleasure. Oh, the pleasure Thank you mine, so Jeremy. much. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's been great. Hey, man. Let's keep in touch. For sure. Okay. Talk soon.